Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, good afternoon to those who are online. Um, we are about to start our side event, which is looking at multi-stakeholder systems that will, uh, processes that will enable us have change in African agriculture and food systems, change for the better. And um, for those who are online, I believe, I hope that you are getting uh, through to us. We are still expecting a few people to come in, including representatives from AGRA. Our numbers are small, so I think we can just open up and be as participatory as possible. Next slide. So, Malabo, 2014, and we have uh, representatives of the African Union Commission who are here who can talk in more detail about that but that was a, um, a declaration by African heads of state to see change in the agricultural sector, change that will be beneficial, not only in terms of increased agricultural output, but have beneficial impact in terms of wel the welfare and well-being of smallholder farmers. It's going to be ending in 2015, but as will come up later, it is apparent that Yes, progress has been made, but so far the records show that only a few countries are on track to meet the set targets. So that's one of the things that have exercised our minds, and for that reason, we have been thinking about what can be done, not only to facilitate or accelerate implementation of uh, the declaration, but more importantly, to shape and inform what should be done post-2025 in a way that would be to the optimum benefit of uh, the smallholder farmers as well as other people who are affected by the food systems in various African countries. So this afternoon, we are going to have a conversation about the engagement of multiple stakeholders in this process. And it will involve presentations by a team from the Natural Resources Institute of the University of Greenwich. And the presentations will mainly be about cases that we have worked with and experienced from the outcomes that they can actually make a difference. Multi-stakeholder processes can make a difference in achieving objectives in various agricultural subsectors. After that, We'll have a panel that will share their views, but before then we would like to hear opening remarks from the current director of uh, the Natural Resources Institute, Professor Cheryl Hendricks, but she is um, uh, unable to attend this event, so we have Dr. Kate Weladaya who will do that on her behalf. So Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gideon, and thank you very much. Um, very happy to be here. Sorry that Cheryl Hendricks couldn't come. Some people, I think, know her. Um, so I'm Kate Wellard, also at Natural Resources Institute, speaking on, on her behalf to really just provide some introductory kind of comments around why stakeholder processes, what's, what's going to be different, you know, what's, what's really needed to make a difference. So. Um, I'll, let me just give you some of her remarks. So, of course, delighted um, to, to be speaking to the group, and thank you very much for attending. All protocols observed. Um, obviously, the, the Africa Food System Summit um, is taking place within the context of various initiatives. Um, um, so, Gideon's mentioned the Malabo Declaration. We have um, the UN Food System Summit, lots of sustainable development goals. Rome Declaration on Nutrition, um, Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and all of these, of course, are evolving initiatives and involve a huge number, or should involve and do involve, a huge number of different stakeholders. It's just actually going to be actually an implementation on the ground. Um, I think to date, progress against some of these initiatives is rather slow, um, and um, of course, there are so many reasons for that, and I'm not really going to unpack all of those today, but generally, the impacts of um, climate change are obviously um, a, a, um, a 
worsen the situation, and we've got um, security issues, the growth and, and inequality between countries. I think what we're really looking at, of course, are complex, multi-dimensional challenges. There are social issues, which in of course includes nutrition, health. There are economic issues, human productivity, trade, growth. Um, and then there are environmental issues, natural resources um, at multiple levels, and of course, climate change. Um, and addressing these complex issues and interacting issues are going to take a different mindset. We, we're looking for a, for a new way forward. Um, and the, this summit is, is, is bold. It has a bold agenda um, to unlock policy and financial commitments and innovations to achieve not just productive and nutritious outcomes, but productive, nutritious, inclusive, resilient, sustainable food systems in Africa. So very admirable um, and you know, a great challenge for us. But of course, achieving this is going to take a transformational approach. And the, the, the different actions that are required at multiple levels. So of course, stakeholders across the food system need to be in, engaged to catalyze actions. So politicians, government at multiple levels, so the, the government themselves, with the legislators, um, at multiple levels within country, regionally as well, civil servants, private sector, large, small, small scale, micro level, farmers organizations, civil society organizations, development partners, financiers, researchers, medias, um, competent authorities. Sorry if I've missed any of the stakeholders who are, who are present. I mean, this is, the, the challenge is so big, so very much needed um, that multiple engagement. Um, but then different stakeholders, of course, have different objectives. They have different perspectives on what is an in inclusive, resilient, um, sustainable food system, what it looks like, different narratives and views on what's needed to transform the current system to achieve these objectives. And of course, those narratives and views are shaped by people's backgrounds, shaped by experiences, institutions, roles, and of course, um, set against that, different stakeholders have different um, power, different agency um, to be involved and to actually um, initiate change. So I think part of the conversation today will, means we need to try and recognize that there are multiple stakeholders with, and there are multiple framings, multiple narratives, and all of these are relevant, of course, to the food systems transformation. So the, the um, different stakeholders also will envisage different entry points and they'll have different priorities. So we talked about the social, environmental, economic aspects, and of course there are, there are other within those, but, but there'll be different priorities. Um, and all of these, of course, we're talking about stakeholders um, as part of the system. Um, so really, I think what we are um, suggesting and I think that the summit will be calling for is to try to do things differently to address these complex, systemic problems. So it's moving in a systemic way beyond single issues um, to looking at systems-wide, um, transdisciplinary thinking and approaches. So we have different stakeholders, yes, but within that um, kind of a systemic thinking. And as well, um, fostering learning. Um, so of course, if we're talking about um, systemic change, then envisaging a new system, co-designing parts of the system at multiple levels. So at farm level, landscape, national level. Just maybe one quick example, if we're talking about redesigning a current um, system, which is a, a si looking at production side, which is a cereal-based system um, to meet multiple objectives. It, it might be production heavy at the moment, but if you've got nutrition as an objective, if you've got market as an objective, if you've got social objectives, the, the framing, the, the stakeholders who are, in, who are involved um, are gonna be really quite different. So bringing stakeholders together will um, involve also understanding um, different contributions, of course, so different knowledge systems. We know that different stakeholders have different types of knowledge within their own context, so whether it's they're at farm level, whether they're traders, financiers, policy, but building partnerships will involve, or the, the, the proposition is sharing that knowledge 
um, and linking between local and higher level global, up to global knowledge systems. Um, and of course, <laughs> back to the topic here, policy and institutional change is integral to supporting transformation. Um, that's, that's, that's whether it's sustainable production, whether it's processing, trading, consumption, and through the kind of policy changes would be perhaps allocating resources or can include absolutely massive range here, but we could talk about allocating resources, about changing incentives, whether it's taxes and subsidies to incentivize, um, whether it's a healthy production, sustainable. Um, other examples could be innovative finance, standards, certification. So again, huge range of what can be policy institutional change to support um, this type of, you know, the transformation that's needed here. So um, the, the role of decision makers from public and private sectors, from, from civil society and development partners is obviously absolutely critical. And given the complexity, um, we are proposing again that it's important for stakeholders to be open to engage with each other and also to learn. So um, I didn't want to take up too much time because I think there's going to be some very exciting things that are going to come from the case studies. Um, but the kind of questions that we might want to be thinking about as we move through this session are, given the multi-stakeholders that we are in, in the engaged and would um, need to remain engaged and even bring more stakeholders on board for this kind of transformation, what type of engagement is needed to inform effective inclu and inclusive um, policy engagement processes? So what type of engagement is needed? Um, and type of policy process, again, just to kind of include what, think about what that might involve. So it's setting the agenda. So who's deciding what's, what should be there, what's even going to be debated, and then designing that process, implementing it, monitoring and learning. So that's, I think, what we're talking about here ourselves in terms of policy um, processes, but also good to have other um, um, if there is other understandings, then it would be interesting to, to look at those too. So, and who needs to be involved in policy processes? So, which stakeholders at which level? And then how? How to engage different stakeholders? So, I think I've tried to set up why um, multi-stakeholder engagement is important to address these complex, challenging, real, <laughs> systemic, and um, complex problems. So I, what I'm going to do now is to hand over to my colleagues. That we're going to have um, three different presentations. So um, maybe I can just mention that Richard Lamble is going to speak about his work with Saila, um, about using evidence and learning to inform decision making. That's policy investments, develop more equitable and sustainable agriculture. So that'll be the first one. And then Gideon's going to come and speak about Oh, anyway, <laughs> between Gideon and Louise, going to come, uh, Gideon will speak about um, work in West Africa with, around de-risking with farmers and other stakeholders. And finally, Louise will, is going to talk about um, building um, connections with stakeholders to, for um, quality insurance, quality assurance. Yeah, great, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Kate. Um, so, yeah, I think we're a little bit, little bit behind time. So moving straight ahead, if we can move on to uh, the next slide. Uh, next one, please. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to speak to here is a little bit around um, the idea of strengthening decision-making processes in relation to agriculture and foods, food systems policy um, and looking at the role of multi-stakeholder social learning processes um, in relation to this, um, sharing a little bit of background and then some experience and lessons from one particular uh, program uh, called SELA. Next slide, please. Okay, 
So as Kate has already sort of indicated, and I, everyone in this room will be very well aware, um, agriculture has become a lot more complex. Agriculture and food systems, increasingly it's recognized the demands on those systems of economic, social, and environmental. And there are a whole view, um, diversity of, of stakeholders, perspectives, beliefs, and positions, as well as values in relation to these agriculture and food systems. And associated with that, there's also a whole range of concepts and approaches that have emerged from different groups, different organizations, around how these issues, challenges, and opportunities might be tackled. So the aim for this very brief presentation is to firstly consider policy processes um, and options for engagement, just very brief and um, sort of uh, background slides, and then to go straight on to share experiences from uh, a project that was um, involved research and learning around sustainable agriculture intensification um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So pro policy processes, um, Again, again, in this room, probably everybody is already very aware, um, there might be a perception that policy processes are relatively straightforward, that you, you, you go through a, a straightforward process of identifying a problem, uh, looking at um, the agenda for the problem, considering policy options, design your policy, implement it, and then you evaluate it. I think the reality, probably everyone here knows, is a bit more complex, messy, and political. And so the situation around most policy processes is more like the, the diagram at the bottom of the slide than a linear process on the top. Next slide, please. So what are the options for engaging with policy processes? Uh, for many, the main option is lobbying. And lobbying is a, a very pass powerful way of trying to influence um, political or public officials on a particular issues. Another approach is advocacy, where a particular individual or organization will try to make a case on behalf of other parties. Um, and both of these approaches, as well as other approaches, can use science and evidence-based um, information to try and inform policy. And so research scientists and other researchers have a key role to play in this. And this sort of so-called evidence-based policy making is very widely promoted um, um, and often supported by a whole range of donor initiatives. Next slide, please. So, and as a result, you'll often see in policy documents very nice statements, um, including all the words that we've been mentioning so far this afternoon about inclusivity, sustainability, resilience, all these things. But implementation of this policy um, again, I think we've all probably experienced is a bit, of more, bit more of a challenge. And one, some of the reasons for that revolve around one that Louise has just mentioned or will be mentioning around capacity. The capacity issues are a big factor. The whole issue around political economy of how decisions are actually are made around different stakeholders, so the political economy as aspects. But also, very importantly, divergences in beliefs about what should be done in relation to agriculture and food systems. All these things feed into uh, the kind of evidence that people seek out. So people tend to seek out evidence that confirms what they already believe. It's very rare to find people that will seek out evidence that challenges what they already believe. You tend to seek out evidence that confirms it. And this so-called confirmation bias is really important in influencing decisions. And then, of course, within these systems, there are also very powerful actors who can shape the policy agenda very early on. So by the time you come to thinking about policy design, the framing of it in the first place has already been set up. So for all these reasons, often this is why policy implementation doesn't follow what appears to be um, a very well-designed policy. So, um, one way of approaching this is not to say, okay, evidence isn't important, but it's to say that evidence is very important, but alongside evidence, you need democratic representation in these processes. And um, a chap called Parkhurst has written a very good book on this, and he, he refers to what you can call the good governance of evidence. And by the good governance of evidence, he means the use of rigorous, systematic, and technically valid pieces of evidence 
within decision-making processes that are representative of and accountable to the population served. And to me, this is what the, this is the institutional setups that we be, should be trying to establish within um, African countries to make good use of evidence, the right use of evidence, and that evidence then informs policy implementation, not just policy design. Uh, next slide, please. So in, a, in an attempt to sort of contrib contribute to this good governance of evidence, um, multi-stakeholder social learning could be a way of contributing to this. So the idea of multi-stakeholder social learning has been around for some time, um, and basically what we mean by multi-stakeholder multi social learning is that we're, we're focusing on the learning through social interaction as opposed to learning through, uh, say, uh, documents, journal papers, etc. Most of us actually, the main way we actually learn in reality is through social interaction. So making use of that becomes an important part of this whole process of informing decision making. And the advantage of social learning is that not only do you learn about knowledge, uh, you acquire knowledge, so-called instrumental learning, you also achieve communicative learning. So in the same way, if I just stand up here and talk now, maybe there's some instrumental learning going on, but there's not much communicative learning because it's one way. There's no two-way interaction going on here. I've got, I haven't got a clue. You could be sitting there thinking, this guy's talking nonsense. Okay, so the interaction becomes really important. So this kind of structured multi-stakeholder social learning has taken place a lot around problems of natural resource management at, at sort of localized level. But to date, there hasn't been much attempt to try it at a national level to inform national policy processes. Um, but there are examples, and some of the examples within in, um, European countries, for example, have been these attempts at citizens' assemblies. So, for example, in the UK, there was a citizens' assembly around climate change, and uh, apparently that was a, a key factor that, that, that gave the confidence to the government to bring in a policy which was going to ban um, the use of the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. So that was a multi-stakeholder process that actually led to a very definite policy decision. So how you, how you bring in these multi-stakeholder processes must vary with context. So the context is really important according to what kind of process that you choose. So what I'd like to share next, please, is uh, the experience of uh, a program called SELA. Uh, next slide, please. Um, which was uh, funded by um, what was then DFID, now FCODO U UK. Um, this was a program involving a number of research projects, but it was aiming to not only do research, okay, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, but also learning. So it was trying at the same time to set up a process of not only um, co-generating knowledge, but looking at how that knowledge can be used through a learning process, both within a within country, but also across country in a number of uh, countries here in Africa. Um, and this was this was set up as a sort of sailor learning alliance. So it's a learning alliance around how to achieve more equitable and sustainable agricultural intensification, which in itself is quite a controversial term. So this learning alliance was set up. Um, it involved um, many stakeholders, diverse stakeholders, ranging from civil servants, private sector, NGOs, journalists, researchers, donors, elected representatives, in um, five countries here in, in Africa, Ghana, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Malawi, and Zambia. There was a facilitation team set up for in each country to guide that learning process. And basically, it was open agenda what were the issues were. The issues were very context specific, but broadly along the lines of equity trade-offs and services. And the idea was then to use this to contribute to actor and network capacity strengthening as part of this process of the good governance of evidence. Next slide, please. So the issues were very diverse. Every country, uh, different issues emerged. And the idea was that the issue was, uh, had to be a prominent issue, but also there was an opportunity to take that issue forward. And these issues varied tremendously in complexity 
from, for example, looking at the full armyworm problem in Ghana through to the very complex problems around land tenure in southern Africa. So a high degree of complexity, or varying degrees of complexity rather, and but very different issues in different countries. Next slide, please. And here's just sharing three examples of outcomes. So if, for example, in Ghana with the fall army worm, um, the, the government was, um, had, was importing pesticides to control fall army worm. Uh, there was major concerns amongst researchers about the environmental effects of those pesticides. Um, but through interaction, through stakeholders, uh, through experiential learning around the process, the government then changed its policy of only focusing on chemical pesticides to bringing in biorationals, and so the whole planning and expenditure allocation changed as a result of that learning process. The second example came from Ethiopia, where it was recognized there was opportunities for ICT innovation in agricultural extension, but the various parties were not familiar with what the other parties um, could offer or were needed. And so again, through a, um, a learning process, um, a policy that was already in place, it was already a stated policy to make much more use of ICT and extension in Ethiopia, but within the, uh, the extension uh, community, what was really on offer wasn't really clearly understood. So through this learning process, there was a, a strengthening of capacity of understanding this whole idea of what ICT could offer, but also from the ICT providers of what was needed. And this led to a much clearer pathway for policy implementation in Ethiopia. And then finally, an example from Zambia was this whole issue around uh, promotion in extension services of, for example, conservation agriculture as a way forward. But introducing the concept of trade-off analysis gave a language to extension people through a whole learning process to do a trade-off analysis of interventions such as conservation agriculture and other approaches and through a trade-off lens it became clear much more clear to be able to for farm for extension people who already knew this but it gave them a language to explain why conservation agriculture may or may not be working in a particular context because of the trade-offs involved so those just those are just three of many many examples next slide please and this, you won't better read all this, but some of the individuals involved um, gave such positive feedback. Individuals from within government, private sector, and media. Uh, just to pick out one there, participating journalist from Ethiopia, um, a statement from him, I've now come to understand how complex agriculture is, which might seem like a small thing, but media is really important. And to understand, to really understand these issues, rather than just getting a press statement, is really important if you're trying to move the narratives around agriculture and food systems. So those are just things. So final slide. Thank you. One more slide. So these are just some of the lessons that emerged from this process. Very quickly going through them. The first one is, if you're engaging this process, you've got to be responsive to, to decision-maker priorities, but also other stakeholder priorities. Secondly, these national learning alliances were quite informal, and many senior government representatives um, expressed their appreciation to be able to participate informally in, this, in a very open dialogue and tend to take that learning back into more formal decision-making processes. Thirdly, um, this process can be a slow process, but, in, but it's important to give time for that interaction to take place. And then linked to that is this, the whole issue about giving a, a safe space for what might be called constructive con contestation, so that issues can be reframed. And this can't take place in a 10-minute meeting. It needs an ongoing process for that, for that to happen. That doesn't just mean a talking shop. So it's really important that it's well organized that, okay, you open up the dialogue, but then you close it down again in terms of deliberative processes. So this, this combination of opening up, but then closing down to, more, to move towards decision is, is important and it needs a structured process. Um, experiential learning can be really important because unlike a meeting like this, where you could be sitting yawning, if it's an experiential learning, you're engaging 
and it's, it's a much more effective way of learning. This requires very strong facilitation skills. It's a very demanding thing to do, and in general, um, how it's, it's quite, a square, as quite a scarce commodity, those sort of facilitation skills. Certainly from my experience, trying to find them, it, it's quite difficult. Um, but you, you need a strong overall structure and direction, but you need flexibility within that because many things are changing. The policy environment is changing all the time. So you need flexibility, but a clear direction of where you're trying to get to. These changes then, um, at the moment, the opportunity for researchers to contribute to this are a little bit limited. So to some extent, the systems need to change if researchers are to be able to, be, to, to offer evidence um, to be more uh, useful in these processes. And finally, uh, funding agencies and governments um, can play an important role here, uh, not least in terms of providing resources to support such learning processes. But it's important that they step back and let the learning process evolve and not try to dominate the agenda. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. So now we move very quickly to Dr. Louisa Bayomi, and um, she will try to do her presentation between six and eight minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. So good afternoon, everyone, standing on all existing protocols. Um, if you wouldn't mind, next slide, please. Okay. So. Um, Thanks, Richard, for setting the scene. You've actually made my life a little bit easier because I don't have much time. And so to unpack some of the things I was going to be speaking about, um, I think you've already done that. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, compliant food safety, transformation of food safety systems, um, and some of the experience that we've had at NRI, working with some stakeholders, um, both in the public and private sector. Um, so, by the way, this isn't a depiction of um, all the systems across, uh, but I needed, to, I needed to, to try and make a point that this is something which is not uncommon. I actually reside in Nigeria, and I've actually stopped eating beef, I would say, because when I see um, cattle either drinking water out of gutters and things like this, um, and knowing what I know about food safety hazards and risk, it's kind of like... Um, I'm a bit cautious. Um, at the bottom, um, you've got maybe slum settings. We've got some students working um, in urban slums. Um, and you've got wet markets there. So these are you know, sites that are, are you may find across some African countries. As um, Kate and, and uh, Richard said, not all the countries are at, at the same level. Some are progressing a lot more than others. Next slide, please. Okay, um, could you press on the next one? So there are a number, you know, in, in order to move forward, we need to understand why we are where we are. And, um, you know, there's an absence of data which is constantly being reported. You know, you've got the World Bank, USAID. We keep talking about this data, this absence of data. and. Um, you know, data speaks volumes, and when you don't have it, there's a tendency not to really to, to act because, you know, as Richard was saying, you want evidence and you need some more data. Could you continue, please? Thanks. And so, you know, um, I would say um, it hasn't really been a priority um, for governments, um, you know, investing and building capacity of competent authorities over the years. Um, it takes a lot of money, and very few governments actually allocates a specific budget for this, for this side of things. Um, you've got the SPS measures, which are constantly involving plant health regulations and so on. Um, they, um, um, they are not supporting at the, at the ground level um, enough. Um, and of course, you've got rising population of young entrepreneurs. If you look at the demographics across Africa, you will see a, a large percentage are under the age of 50. And we've got a problem with jobs. And so sometimes it's out of necessity that these individuals 
are, are finding ways to, to survive. And of course, you've got a lot of um, vendors, you've got ma ma many, many micro and small businesses coming up, and they haven't got the skills or the knowledge about food safety hazards and um, the requirements for compliance and so on. Um, low communication of, and yet when there are breaches, even by the slightly larger um, enterprises, um, it's not followed through with prosecution uh, and so on. So the laws are there, but um, we're, we're not following through on that. Again, infrastructure, you can't take your infrastructure away. You see that the environment doesn't lend itself to good hygiene or good production practices, so that is an issue. Um, and when I talk about infrastructure, I mean very broad, it could be having um, energy to chill um, or to freeze, um, it could be um, water access, or even the energy to even, um, you know, treat the water. To treat water, you need energy. We don't have energy across Africa and a lot of African countries. Um, poor practices in general, even some larger SMEs, their poor practices there. Um, the economic downturn. Um, when you find yourself, um, when, when, when you're being squeezed, you tend to cut corners more. You know, you start adulterating and things like this, which isn't very good. Um, there's conflict, of course, you know, you've got that happening in the Sahel, and of course then you find people trying to survive, and maybe they can't prepare their food in the right way, they don't have the amenities, they don't have the infrastructure, and so you get more food safety issues and foodborne diseases. And of course you've got climate variation and change. I'll come back to some examples and touch on that a little bit um, later. And then the, the elephant in the room is, is, how many minutes? Five minutes, okay. Um, it's about corruption. So, you know, um, a lot of the time there is the money there, um, budgets are assigned, and um, it doesn't get used for the purpose that it's intended. Next slide, please. Okay, so we need data. You know, and we need this data quickly. Foodborne diseases, um, we don't really have a handle on it across some, most of the countries. And um, one of the things that we could do of course, you've got the proxy indicators, you know, if, you've, if someone's got diarrhea, for example, you know the main sources of that. Um, but we found that with a lot of um, small enterprises, they don't have the tools. You know, I find companies investing $200 million in a factory, and I'll rarely find whether it be a pH meter or a, or a, or a moisture meter. So why? That has actually got to change, and I'm not sure whether it's because of a, a lack of awareness um, or it's just that, you know, you can, you can get away with producing things and no one's really going to come and monitor you because there aren't enough boots on the ground. Um, so what we've been doing at NRI um, is trying to have more decentralized testing. So taking away expensive, complicated um, pieces of kit like HPLCs and mass specs and so on and getting them to do very simple tests to verify that their systems are actually um, in control. So for example, um, marine toxins or mycotoxins, antibiotics, heavy metals, heavy micro, these are all things that are contaminating our foods. Um, there've been, there are many, many kits out there. Um, we were contracted by ILRI and I screened about 700 of these commercial kits and we narrowed them down to those ones that can be stored at ambient, for example, because if you're in Africa and there's no chilling facility, you don't want to have to keep these things in the fridge. Um, we narrowed them down to some of the suppliers actually distribute across Africa. Um, easy to use, low maintenance, reliable, fast, all these things that would help whether you be an aggregator or a, or a, or a small enterprise. Um, and of course, these things are being used by industry, but main, mainly in the West. They're routinely used to validate their systems, to assist with product development and so on. And they actually cost a fraction of what it takes for the traditional ways of, of, of testing things. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, um, we've been using these kits because a lot of these kits have not actually been validated for traditional foods. It's been mainly, you know, grain or maize or, you know, rice, that sort of thing. So we decided to take some of them and we use some um, research innovation funds within the university. Um, and we looked at 
Yamflower, for example, we found heavy metals in there. I won't name countries, I don't want to name and shame. Um, cassava, issues with heavy metals, and cyanide. Um, a lot of the work on cyanide was done many, many years ago. And with the climate changing now, we've, we've found that um, a particular country took about 60 samples. And there are high levels of cyanide, up to 200 ppm and so on. In the, in, in the actual dried product. So th there are problems out there. And this is a, a crop that one billion um, uh, people depend on. Um, you've got hibiscus leaves, which is very popular. Zobo, if you're in Nigeria. Um, again, there are heavy metals in there. Tiger and that milk. Um, we had some issues of E. coli. Um, again, something very popular. It is sold as a, a very highly nutritious um, um, commodity. Um, melon seeds, for those of you that know, it's an EU-controlled product. It's been an EU-controlled product for at least 10 years now, I believe. Um, beans were recently banned as well. So these are all the things that, you know, the locals are consuming. Um, and so when we talk about food nutrition, we cannot get away from talking about um, food safety um, issues. Um, and a lot of enterprises don't have any idea. And some of these things that we're doing, some of the work we're doing has actually come from discussions with businesses. Next slide, please. Um, and there's been a lot of funding, and it's commendable, but it's not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough. Um, you know, from the bottom up, the micro, the, the aggregators, the SMEs, they all need support. They need to be aware of what's out there. They need, we need to validate some more of these things. We need the data. And without doing these tests, the competent authorities as they currently stand are not able to get a grip from north, east, south, west as to what's going on and where the priority um, intervention should be. So um, I would say, we heard about the Malibu Agreement. There was a promise to commit more money towards um, you know, food safety system and so on. It's not happening. So it's, you know, we're paying kind of like paying lip service to this issue, and it's actually a serious issue which is um, running away. You know, the train is moving, and we're not managing to, to keep up with it. Next slide, please. So as far as I'm concerned, I mean, if it was something you were making in your home, you know what is safe. You won't be giving yourself unsafe food. Um, governments really need to reassess their values. You know, there needs to be some element of pride. Um, it's getting boring, keep talking about, you know, the, the foodborne illnesses, 50% coming from um, Africa, and so on and so forth. We don't want to keep talking. Let's actually do something about it. There needs to be a vision. You know, what do these countries want? Is it uh, the best tiger nut juice globally? You know, we hear of, you know, New Zealand kiwi or New Zealand lamb or Rwandan coffee and so on. What is it going to be um, for the rest of these countries who are falling behind? We need commitment and, of course, accountability. Um, nothing happens when someone eats something and they have diarrhea or there's an outbreak of some disease. Most of the time, it's, it's not spoken about, you know, and they're onto the next one. So there's very little accountability in that uh, area of food safety and quality, and that needs to change if you're going to have transformation in that area. Next slide, is that it? I think it might be it. Could I have the next slide, please? Yes, that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luis. And um, since um, I'm the timekeeper, I'll hand over this slide. Uh, so, which one? Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, I'm supposed to talk about farm risk, but I want to start off with just linking what uh, Luis said with our key objective for this discussion that is multi stakeholder involvement in effecting transformation of agriculture and food systems. And I will use um, an example of a colleague who went around testing street food in Accra. Um, and I'm saying Accra because I'm from Ghana. Last night I walked around the streets close to the hotel where we are staying. And there is a, a very active and buoyant um, informal restaurant system around. You can eat anything you want. They all look very appetizing. The aroma is great. But when he did the test, he found lots of the food being sold on the streets to be highly contaminated. 
The results were presented at a workshop, and before the workshop ended, he was called to a ministry in Accra, and they met the minister directly. Why? You are saying these things. You are causing panic at the public level. If you are saying the food is contaminated, what should people eat? So government, instead of saying, okay, you have highlighted a big challenge, what should we do about it? Was more interested in how do we put this under the carpet so that people don't panic? And I think that is where a multi-stakeholder approach would be more relevant because if a, a, a good number of people are saying we need to address this issue and they are working together with government to find the interventions that are necessary to avoid any uh, problems, then I believe that there's a good chance that the change will happen. Otherwise, we will think that quality assurance is only for exports and has nothing to do with the domestic food market. But now let's go on to an example of where this approach was adopted in implementing a project that was looking basically at risks in the agricultural sector. And you have a number of those risks. And what I will say about this is that um, what we'll be sharing um, all the slides, all the presentations. So if you are not on any mailing list that you have and we have and you want to be sure that you get uh, the presentations, please make sure that you write your uh, email address and name on a notebook that I've put out there. But looking at these risks, what is very clear is that they are individual risk, but most of them mutually reinforce each other. And they also lead to challenges that many people will talk about because in every country, if you ask farmers, what is your biggest uh, challenge? They will talk about lack of finance. But lack of finance is not because bankers hate farmers, it is simply because banks see farmers as too high a risk to take on. So we were involved with, um, in three countries in piloting a project that tried to address um, these risks and not to assume that just dealing with one is enough. We had to take an approach that was cross-cutting and ensure that if you succeed in addressing one particular risk, you don't end up creating others. Because if you succeed in driving up yields and people cannot market what they produce, they are going to be challenged in terms of the ability to sell and make more money. So that is one of the issues that we try to, to address. Does it seem to be worth it now? Can you take us to the next slide? because this doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. So what we try, our approach was to recognize that dealing with a risk separately doesn't produce optimum outcomes. And rather than just go assuming that there is nothing on the ground, so I have to start creating everything, the approach was look at what exists, and if it can be improved, improve it. If they are missing tools, develop them to complement what already exists. And in this particular uh, project, the pile, uh, one of the things we experimented was, instead of farmers just coming in as, okay, we are doing this for you, can we put them in the driving seat? So we deliberately brought the farmer uh, representative organizations into the driving seat in the formulation of the project agenda, the prioritization for each country, and um, this project was implemented in three countries, Burkina Faso, Tanzania, and Zambia. And they were involved in the design, implementation, and also monitoring the outcomes of uh, the various interventions. And it involved the engagement of various uh, actors, input suppliers, financiers, storage services provided, traders, and researchers, in addition to the farmers who were in the driving seat. And again, at the public sector level, we had involvement involving um, extension services providers, information services providers, and policy makers who we were working with to ensure that they created and maintained the required enabling uh, actions. And here I would say that under the project, there was a deliberate effort not just to engage with policy makers at the executive arm of government only, but also to involve uh, legislators. So. 
Uh, can you just keep? Yeah, bring it all out. That's okay. Yeah. So, among the tools that we try to promote, but again, I'm stressing that we try to do all this together as one package and not just as individual interventions. So we had crop um, uh, agricultural insurance and different types of insurance products were made available. But the most important thing is that we bundled the insurance that was provided to the farmers against the risks, the natural risks that we identified along with the provision of um, credit to the farmers and it involved um, working with the farmers and farmers organizations and um, the financiers and input, input distributors in designing specific packages that suited the context of the uh, three countries that this project was implemented in. With access to inputs, we ensure that because of this bundling with insurance that that was available and input uh, suppliers who benefited from this arrangement by being engaged did so because they were able to be more certain about who was going to buy and the volumes that would be required and make their own orders based on fairly accurate estimates of what the market could absorb. And some of them actually ended up, for instance, in Zambia, working with the farmer organizations and insurance companies and the commodity exchange to create their own credit products that enable the farmers to access uh, these inputs. And um, extension agents were involved. And again, uh, in this particular case, what happened was they worked with the farmer organizations who facilitated their involvement in um, engaging with farmers. And they also worked with the financiers because if I'm going to a farmer's field, I can be your eyes. Even though I'm not employed by the bank, I'm going to look at what is happening on the farm and I can provide the data which will enable you to monitor what is happening there without necessarily having to spend more in terms of monitoring. So the next slides, double click. Yeah. We also worked on uh, improved marketing systems and here we looked at the market information systems. When you Google uh, uh, market information systems for many countries, you'll find a lot of information. Most of it is based, uh, uh, focused on prices, and the prices don't tell you anything about what will be the future prices. It's only about current and historic prices, and it's only also about a range of um, informal markets that these prices are being reported for. It doesn't give you any idea how much premium you will get if you sell a quality product. So in the countries where we worked uh, with, uh, with this pilot, what we tried to do was to make sure that there is information available on quality-related premiums that are on offer, and also work to generate some information that will give some advanced indication of output which is to be expected so that uh, various actors can take different positions on whether they want to face any uh, risk in terms of uh, price volatility going forward. The policy actions that were pursued involved not only the national farmers organizations who were working with uh, a, a, a range of stakeholders at a national level to engage with the policy makers, but you also had regional farmers organizations who used their platforms to bring up some of the issues that were relevant and cause attention to be paid and therefore encourage action to be taken by governments to create a more enabling uh, environment. Next slide. So what happened in the particular case of Burkina, and I'm using that because um, in some of that, in, in Tanzania and um, in Zambia, some of the farmers who benefited and the traders who benefited were not your typical small scale farmer, but in Burkina Faso, we had to work with very, very small scale farmers, maximum area under cultivation, two hectares. And whereas in, um, in Tanzania, for instance, you have warehouses that take up to 5,000 tons capacity. In Ta Burkina Faso, the restriction was don't go beyond 60 tons, otherwise your warehouse will be empty. So we worked with them on that. We worked with a, uh, an NGO which was providing insurance 
And with MFIs, we were providing finance to create the package that the farmers needed. And that the project, six, six warehouses with 60 ton capacity were constructed. And what made a difference, what made a difference was that whereas before then, similar warehouses were there, a similar system was operating where people could store. Under this system, you had a quality assurance system instituted, and that quality assurance system was not based on any uh, theoretical uh, uh, codification. It was based on consultations between the farmers, traders, and major formal off-takers, including WFP, and that's what it was said. And the idea was that those uh, standards should be able to facilitate trade between smallholders and the formal market. Next slide. So what happened as a result of these arrangements, it was possible for uh, the participating farmers, which numbered about 33,000, to access production loans. Maybe it's not going to change um, the dynamics of anybody's pocket in this room, because maybe I suspect that most of you are paying about $150 per night for your hotel room. But for the small scale farmers doing, producing at this scale, $150 was a game changer. And by using that to access input on a timely basis, evidence, and this is not based on our own estimate, it was based on an independent impact assessment. Their yields on the average rose from 1.5 tons to 3.5 tons per hectare, which was a major change. The, use of the storage facilities was up well over 80%, which means as an operation on its own, it was viable, because you just needed up to about 65 ton uh, capacity utilization um, to, to, be, to, to break even. And when we started, one of the concerns was that if you integrate smallholder farmers into a formal market, the risk is that they will sell everything and come back crying to the government for food bailouts. So we wanted to test whether this small scale farmer is rational enough to know how much they should be selling as a household and how much should be kept for household consumption. And the evidence that came out was that about 70% of the stocks, they sold it into the formal market because the premium was pretty good. They had a premium of um, about 45 to 60% above what they would get in a normal informal market because they were selling quality produce and in volumes that were attractive to the formal buyers. The remaining 30% of the stocks, they care for household consumption. And remember that this is over an increased volume from 1.5 tons to 3.5 tons. So they had, there was evidence that they had food availability increasing for the households. They also, as a result of generating more income, and the income came not only from the premiums that they obtained from, selling quality produce, but also from using credit that they obtained against the stocks to invest in fattening livestock for sale and also in expanding their cotton farms. And as a result, they had, thank you. Uh, the, 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 there were these improvements and that led to uh, something that uh, my dear colleague Kate is excited about that they had more diverse food, an indication that they were eating not just more food, but better food. And we found this to be a very, very useful outcome. And uh, at the same time, youth were attracted into engaging in very basic, um, uh, producing very basic um, produce, not uh, high value um, horticultural products. So we were excited about this, but for us, the major lesson we learned was that it couldn't have been achieved as a result of just a researcher going and working on the project or a farmer organization running off with an idea that they thought would be helpful to them, but because the different stakeholders at national and supported by a regional level activity were able to make moves that caused change that was beneficial. And the even more exciting thing is that even after the project ended, this continued because one of the biggest investments that happened around the co one of the communities where this 60-ton uh, warehouse was uh, built is that a private investor, seeing the business opportunity, 
now constructed three warehouses, 500 tonne capacity each, because there was business and the concept had been, had been proved. So we think that it's important not just to have a good project idea, but also to adopt a process that involves multiple stakeholders working together to ensure that we achieve objectives that can be transformational. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think that we can now move to having some conversation. And um, to do that, we had um, expected, um, if you saw the mails that I sent this morning, I was talking about uh, uh, a distinguished panel of um, um, uh, panelists. Uh, unfortunately, many of them, uh, some of them haven't been able to come. One is still in Nairobi waiting to arrive in Dar es Salaam this evening. One is very unwell and couldn't show up. But we still have um, two very important representatives from the African Union Commission, and I will invite them to come up. Agnes. And uh, as you come up and take your seat up, and I think uh, you, you, have, um, you have the right to be seated. We don't need to be standing up. Uh, so just relax and uh, uh, lead us in the discussions around these issues. And what we will do is that once they have given us their views, we will move very quickly to a democratic process of involving everybody here so that we can hear your voices and learn the le uh, relevant lessons from you as well. So first of all, we would just encourage you to introduce yourselves, and after that, we'll have uh, a couple of questions for you. Okay, I think it's working. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah th thank you uh, s so much for inviting us in, in this event. My name is Justin Koka, and I'm Senior Advisor to CADEP uh, at the African Union uh, Commission. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Agnes Obuogwal. I'm a CADEP m and &E Advisor at the African Union Commission, the Department of uh, Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Environment. Okay, so thank you very much for being willing to lead in our panel discussion and the first question to you is you've heard us the team from nri talk about um, various uh, project activities that have involved uh, the use or the application of a multi-stakeholder approach in terms of effective change first of all can you as individuals tell us what you think of all that we've been saying does it really sound any good to you do you think that there are any important lessons that can be learned from some of these uh, presentations. And after that, I'll come back to you with uh, another question. Thank you. Uh, let me first stand by uh, existing protocol. Um, we need to understand, first of all, what the AU Commission itself is. Uh, the AU Commission is a body that makes sure that the decisions that were made by heads of state by the AU are implemented. So by itself, it doesn't implement what's coming out, but it makes sure that those decisions are being implemented within the countries or institutions that have been mandated to do that. Uh, and by doing that, uh, the AU Commission have processes in place that are most multi-stakeholder engagements. Uh, the AUC doesn't implement or move on anything without making sure that every stakeholder that's involved in the process is included. If you look at Malabo, uh, we went from Maputo, of course, to Malabo, it's been 20 years, and we're preparing for post-Malabo. Uh, it means also for us to even start talking about post-Malabo, we need to come to you, our stakeholders, and find out what the ideas are and what you think are the key issues. And especially in light of what has happened in the past, both you look at COVID, you look at the war in Ukraine, and what it has brought, these shocks have brought a lot of issues that were not there before. So when we look along the food systems, talking about resilience, it's important for us to see the role of research and innovation in bringing about the necessary leaps 
that are needed to transform our agriculture in Africa. And this is what you brought to the table. Uh, to me, it's important by these three presentations, just looking at your involvement on things that need to be done on the ground, on how we can take cognizance of what is going on and how we can use this in making sure that the next stage of the Malabo commitment are taken to the next stage. One, we are in the middle of finalizing the fourth biannual review. It's mean looking at what has happened since the last one in 2021, when the impact that we looked at was only COVID-19. Now we're looking at impacts above what COVID-19 has done. So already in 2021, there were some setbacks due to COVID. What's gonna happen in 2023? It's even more daunting to see how many countries have still setbacks in moving along with food systems. And I think I cannot emphasize enough that your role will be critical in ensuring that both results that come out of research and development and these innovative ways of doing business involving all the stakeholders is embedded into what the countries need to do. Data is still an issue. We need to make sure that we have quality data coming from the countries so we can make a case. You can't make a case if you don't have the case being backed by evidence. That's what you've been doing, and that's what the AUC is promoting as well. I'll stop here in the interest of time. I can be very passionate in this issue, so I'll let my colleague come in. Uh, if you need to be. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I must say that the work that was presented by all three of you is amazing pieces of work. And uh, this is what Malabo is all about, different levels of implementation. Like what uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Kuka said, Justin, um, the AUC as a commission just provides overall framework in which all these things need to be done as agreed by the member states and it is the institutions at the grassroots level that implement all these things. And sometimes these are being implemented even without the knowledge of what the AU member states have agreed upon. They are, apart from the CADAP framework, which is the main uh, framework for implementation of agriculture, in, for accelerating agricultural development in the whole of Africa, um, there are other um, agreements, there are other decisions that have been made within this framework. And bits and pieces of these um, decisions, 10 major decisions are being implemented at different levels, especially at the country level. But the implementers of these decisions may not even know that they're implementing these decisions. And so that's where stakeholder inclusivity and engagement and all this comes into play. Because we get a group of uh, technicians coming together, agree that this is where Africa needs to go. But not everybody is involved. And that is what um, uh, happens. Maybe the research institutions come together and they say, you know, we need a bio fortification decision or we need something on post-harvest losses or we need something on livestock. And then they come together from different member states. Uh, it's researchers, probably a few extension workers, uh, probably a few non-state actors, but not everybody. And they draft a decision and it goes through the channels and it is finally approved by the heads of state in their summits, in the heads of state summit. Now the process of advocacy and lobbying and awareness creation and communication about these decisions that have been made, there are gaps there. Um, also gaps in the design of these uh, policies and decisions that are made. So the issue of stakeholder engagement is very critical, stakeholder inclusiveness, but again, 
It's also, I must say, impossible to include everyone, however much you try. Just within a member state, I may take an example of the uh, biennial review process or the joint sector review processes that are, are processes that are supposed to be very inclusive within the member states. But you still find that some non-state act actors may come up and say, what is that? We are not included. And yet at the national level, they are supposed to include as many stakeholder agencies as possible in agricultural development process. So this issue of stakeholder involvement is very critical, very, pertain um, very important, and we cannot say that it is the responsibility of the African Union Commission or, or the regional economic communities or you know, Ministry of Agriculture, it is everybody's responsibility. If we know that we are in the agricultural development sector, we should be proactive and say what's happening in our sector, how can I get involved? So that uh, everybody is on board and no one is left behind, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I asked uh, Robin a few minutes ago uh, whether she is going to kick us out of this room at exactly half past three and uh, she has kindly given us 10 extra minutes. So I'll ask um, one question any of you can answer and then we'll, ca we'll come to the uh, participants for any views that you have or questions that you have. And that question is, having endorsed, and that's what I'm hearing from the two of you, that a multi-stakeholder process is beneficial to the formulation of actions and also implementation and monitoring. But it costs money. And um, I'm not sure how many smallholder farmers will be able to contribute, say, five, uh, $5,000 for such a process. So do you have any ideas how this process can be funded on a sustainable basis? Because what we did was through projects. The project ends, the process stops. But we have to have something that is sustained over a long period. Any ideas how this can be done? And um, once they have answered, if you have any uh, question or contribution or comment, please raise your hands. We'll take at, uh, two, three maximum, and then we can uh, close and leave the room for Robin. I think issues of financing has always been in the middle of a lot of things that we do, or any institution does. Uh, but my own, my, this is my personal view. My own take is that countries claim sovereignty. They should show it also by putting money into these processes. It's not up to the international community or to philanthropists to come and help the countries to do this. The country should have a strong private sector that have a social program that also put money back into the system so that the system can be sustained over time. Because once you come with a program, a specific project only has a sunset clause. So when the sunset clause comes, you know, if you didn't put a system that can be sustained over time to make sure that you can cater to these people that need this information, that need this research, that need the data that you're putting in place, there's no way it's gonna go anywhere. So the country has to take over. We are not saying that everything has to be by the country, but the private sector in that country has to be built from the bottom up to ensure that they can contribute to whatever is coming to the country. And that's my personal view. Thank you very much. So very quickly, any views, any comments, any questions from the floor? Yes, please. Um. If anybody else wants, uh, you can raise your hand. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to to just comment or ask a question. But my question is not going to the panelists. Uh, my question is uh, about the last presenter. Uh, your pres during your presentation, you, you spoke about the, how you managed to design an insurance model 
and it has been successful for one country that is, that is Burkina Faso. Now, uh, from the experience, most of the insurers are not, are not uh, interested to insure farmers because you know farmers are engaging in production, uh, which maybe sometimes when it happens, there is a, a disaster or any risk for example, floods or drought, it cuts across all farmers. So there are, there are massive losses which are incurred. So insurers do not want to engage in that because they know at that level, they may be having a huge a loss of insurance, of insurance, yes. So probably you can, can we get some get some, some, some how, how, how other countries should, should also uh, adopt that, that, that model which, are, which you, have, you have shown. Because Burkina Faso seems to be very successful because of multi-stakeholders engagement. Uh, for example, Tanzania, maybe insurance may not be, is not working well. So probably you can give us some. But if we can introduce it, Sarah, Yeah, my name is Leticia William. I work uh, with the Agriculture Council of Tanzania. Thank you. Any others? So, yeah, that's an interesting question, and um, I, I would say that. In Tanzania, when we were working with the farmers' organization here, ins crop insurance or agricultural insurance was originally not a priority because they said we are happy with the pro on the production side, concentrate on the marketing side, and post-harvest issues. So that was the issue here, but there was a lot of learning from what is happening in Zambia, and Zambia also presents a, an, a very interesting case where a privatized insurance company was willing to offer insurance on very, very competitive terms to smallholder farmers. And it was because they were working with a bank which was providing credit to the farmers to acquire inputs, but part of the credit paid the insurance premium. So there was no risk that the farmer would not pay for that uh, insurance product. It worked excellently for a number of years. Then came year seven. And I like to call it year seven because, not just because it was the seventh year, but it was a very problematic year. The scale of drought in Zambia that year was huge. It cut across most of the country because of El Nino. And because of that, the claims that were made in that year was sufficient to wipe out all the premiums that had been paid over the previous six years. So the insurance industry could not contain that loss. And that has created a, a, a number of major problems for them. But what other countries have done, including India, that Africa can learn from, is that when you have uh, uh, claims or an incident of a, uh, an insured um, event, occurring at such scale, that the commercial insurance market cannot contain it. You have to have a public intervention, either through the use of a calamity fund or some other fund that cushions off the, the, the level that cannot be absorbed by the private um, insurance industry. So this is something that we think is worth looking into and um, I believe that it is important that as multi-stakeholders who are interested, not just in saying, okay, if you have risk, take insurance, that we have an insurance product that can actually work and be sustainable. Just to, to complement what you said, this is a role that the African Union has, uh, has given to the ARC, the African Risk Capacity, uh, so that when there are natural disasters that affect the whole country, then if a country have bought into the guarantee with ARC, the ARC, as an insurer, will take this risk up. And I think it's working in a lot of countries that we've seen. Uh, the recent case was Madagascar, where 
ALC has really uh, come up with intervention when there were problems. And I think this is a model that is started to bear some fruit. Uh, and as we move into the future, more and more countries will be signed up to ARC and we'll be getting these insurance benefits as guarantees against any natural disasters and things that's going to happen. So thank you very much for your time and your patience, but we hope that um, from here we'll continue with these conversations. And um, if we don't already have your email contact, please make sure that you leave it for us. We want to be able to follow up with you and continue the conversations because what we want to see is a process which is sustainable, not just for a workshop and then we go away, but that we can keep uh, driving the agenda forward for an inclusive, sustainable, and resilient agriculture and food system in Africa. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. <laughs>